Millions of years ago, ice glaciers pushed up rocks and carved out hollows to form the Boundary Waters Canoe Area in northern Minnesota. It's more than a million acres of forests and lakes, all part of the Superior National Forest. We'll see what it's like to travel and camp in this great stretch of land and water today as Discovery takes a journey through the wilderness. Discovery 70, the award-winning program for young people, with Bill Owen. Hi, and welcome to Discovery. Today we're in northern Minnesota, only five miles from the Canadian border. This is the Boundary Waters Canoe Area, the BWCA for short a part of the Superior National Forest. There are more than 1,200 miles of canoe routes here, much of it along the 200-mile Canadian boundary. This has been designated as a wilderness area, which means its wild or primitive state is to be preserved. No roads can be built here, no buildings erected. This is one of 88 wilderness preserves within our national forest system. To preserve the wilderness, motors are not permitted in most of the BWCA. Canoes are the only method of transportation. Mike Patterson and his family live in Ely. Good morning, people. Mike has enjoyed camping in the border area since he was a boy. Roberta, his wife, learned how to go wilderness camping when the children were still infants. Mickey, 16 years old, finds paddling a canoe as much fun as a high school dance. Kelly, 13, will probably become a professional guide. He's learning a lot from his father. They all know the wilderness well and love it, as do many Minnesotans. Here's where our camping equipment will be assembled. Another member of our party is Mary Chaffee, a third-year college student who's worked for the past three summers as a guide. She won't be our guide on this trip, however, since Mike Patterson is an experienced camper. Canoe outfitters know the BWCA very well. Don Boland is one of the many experienced guides and packers here on Moose Lake, not far from Ely, Minnesota. You might be a little afraid of the word wilderness. Who can go out in the wilderness? Do you have to be experienced? No, because there's about 4,000 lakes in the canoe country, and an outfitter can outfit a trip according to the party. An outfitter outfits you with all the equipment you need for a canoe trip into the wilderness. You'll have all your food, all your camping equipment, even rain gear. The only thing a party has to furnish of their own is their personal clothing and their fishing tackle. To travel in the BWCA, you need a travel permit issued by the Forest Service. They're also distributed by the canoe outfitters, who are just as concerned with keeping the wilderness as it is. If you want to fish, a fishing license is also required. The routing of campers into different areas keeps any one section from becoming too crowded, which would quickly destroy the wilderness. This type of pack is picked up by its ears, so the straps won't be pulled away from the pack. Even though the lightest pack weighs about 30 pounds, it's no big problem since we won't have to carry it very far. Modern canoes are of lightweight aluminum and manufactured by aircraft builders. The average canoe weighs about 80 pounds and can safely carry 700 to 800 pounds. Canoes are among the safest boats, since they're extremely buoyant. Paddling easily, you can make 15 miles a day. 
There's no rush in the wilderness. It's been here a long, long time. And you don't want to miss any of it. After a little practice, paddling a canoe becomes almost automatic. The person in the bow sets the pace. The one in the stern steers, using what's called a J-stroke. For a moment, the paddle becomes a rudder. Paddling is almost effortless if you keep your stroke smooth. This was the route of the fur trappers and the Indians. They established portages or crossings, which are paths between landlocked lakes. A portage is also a means of getting around waterfalls or rapids. Portage comes from the French word meaning to carry. We'll see how one man can carry an 80-pound canoe across to the next lake. And we'll do that in just a minute. American Indians made their canoes of birch bark or animal skins. When the Europeans arrived here, they quickly adapted the Indian canoe as the only method of transportation possible in a land of many rivers and lakes. These lightweight aluminum canoes have a carrying yoke that makes it easier on your shoulders. An 80-pound canoe does not feel that heavy when it's balanced correctly. And two people can share the load. An experienced canoeer can carry a pack and a canoe at the same time. Since many of the portages are short, however, you can always make two trips. If the rapids aren't too steep, you can tow a canoe over them, but it takes more skill than carrying it on your back. At the end of each portage, the canoe should be put down into the water. A canoe should never be loaded or stepped into unless it's afloat. And it should never be dragged across the ground because of the danger of rock punctures. Since setting up camp takes time, it's always a good idea to start looking for your campsite early in the afternoon. The first person on a campsite has the right to it for 14 days, and no one intrudes on another in the wilderness. There are always plenty of other campsites. The Forest Service has established campsites by building fireplaces and sometimes providing a camp table. After a number of years, the service will move the camp to allow the vegetation to grow back. Mike Patterson knows from experience what makes a good campsite. You know, when I'm looking for a campsite, I normally look for a nice clean rock with a lot of trees and brush cover so you don't have too much wind and fairly deep water off of the rock so I can get good drinking water and water for cooking and uh, a good place to build my fire so that the wind isn't going to blow the sparks around and cause a forest fire. 
And I like a clean campsite, so I look for litter on the ground and garbage throughout the area. At the end of the day, the canoe is brought up on shore. This keeps the wind from carrying it away. And if your campsite doesn't have a table, an upside down canoe makes a fine one. Water and firewood are the first needs of a camp. Unlike the water found in most of our lakes and rivers, the water here is pure enough to drink. No need to boil or use purifying tablets. As a courtesy, a camper always leaves a supply of wood when he breaks camp. There's usually a large amount of driftwood nearby or some fallen tree. Live trees are not cut for firewood. There could hardly be a faster way of destroying the wilderness. In setting up camp, there's always plenty of work for everyone. My home is really in St. Joseph, Missouri, but I suppose in a few years it will be up here. The reason that I like it up here is because it's a place where you can sit on a rock and look out over a lake and the trees, and you feel a kind of contentment that you just don't find any place else. next need in the wilderness is shelter. Well, the tent we have here with us is uh, a fairly new tent to this area. It works quite well in a bush. It has a high ridge so that in the rain, the water runs off it fairly easy. It has a good waterproofing. It's extremely lightweight. It has a sewn-in floor, a sewn-in mosquito netting with a fly front that's tied down securely. It's quite easily put up. All you need is four stakes and a little bit of line and three trees, or three poles. The lakes in the north woods of Minnesota are noted for their fish. Northerns, walleye pike, bass, and lake trout are just a few. And there's more than one use for a canoe paddle. Campfire cooking has some special tricks you'd never think to use at home. It's a lot easier to wash off campfire soot if you put a thin film of soap on the outside of pots and pans before you cook with them. Uh, the meal I'm cooking here for supper is fresh cut fish, which is always a favorite. We we'll use potatoes, uh, dehydrated, which you boil first and you fry. To have a little variation, we are using a reflector oven to make a peach cobbler, which is a very simple dish to make and it gives a little uh, variety to our meal. The peach cobbler is, um, you grease your pan first, and you empty your can of peaches in, and then you have a mix that is already packaged and you add water, stir, and you pour it over. Everyone has a good appetite after paddling for 15 miles, drawing your own water instead of turning on a tap, gathering your firewood and putting up your tent. up after dinner and putting all the food away securely is most important in wilderness camping. A good storage place is under the canoe with your cooking kit on top. A way to protect food from wild animals is to suspend the packs from a tree branch.
Tomorrow, we'll explore the area. We'll see an American bald eagle nest and signs that Indians once used these portages. And we'll do that in just a minute. One of the things we're most aware of in the wilderness is the lack of noise. There are no sounds of machinery, no automobiles, no television. But we do hear things, things we often fail to notice. John Vogel, a ranger from the National Forest Service, often visits campsites to offer help and to be certain that good camping procedures are being followed. How do you do? Mike, uh, may I see your travel permit? Yeah, I'm about here someplace, John. You have time for a cup of coffee? Oh, I think so. Good. Well, I've been making these camp trips every weekend that my husband has off. He's Saturday and Sunday's off, and we take the whole family. And we love the woods. It's uh, you get away from the routine of everyday living. You have peace and quiet. You're together as a family with your children. You get to share everything, everything you see, the beavers, the deer that come out in the evening for their drink. You get to see your child catch their first fish and the glow on their face, their eyes opening so wide. Just being together, you can never express it. You have to be there to see it. It's a closeness that brings us all together. And uh, the work that you carry your pack sack means nothing. It uh, isn't that hard. It's really an enjoyable thing that brings us all closely knit together. We love it. The wildlife of a wilderness area is protected since no hunting is allowed. Beaver houses, many of them now deserted for new ones, can be seen in almost every bay. And the beaver dam has been a most important factor in the wilderness. Whole new areas have been filled in, creating new forests as the beaver dams reclaimed land from the water. There's the eagle's nest we've been searching for. It looks like a large bump on the branch of that tree. It takes a sharp eye to see it, for eagles build their nests in the most remote places possible. This is one of the very few places where the American bald eagle has any chance of survival. Elsewhere throughout the country, they're gradually disappearing. The Canadian portion of this wilderness is called the Quetico Provincial Park, and you're welcome to it by one of the smallest customs houses along the border. How do you do? Hi. The procedure is simple, as it is all along the Canadian-American border. No passport is needed. All together in three canoes. And how long do you expect to be in Canada? Well, we've been there a couple of days. Better part of three days and two nights. Uh -huh. In that case, there won't be any duty on your supplies. It's only after the second day that we charge duty on the supplies. Well, this is a permit to uh, keep while you're in Canada in case you're checked. It's evidence that you went through customs. This is an old portage used first by the Indians. You can still find trade beads, finely polished and drilled pieces of shell that were used both for decoration and for trade. Also, there is vermilion clay a substance the Indians used as war paint.
It's time to break our camp. And that's just as important as setting it up. Well, Roberta and I t have taken, or have taken Mickey and Kelly on these canoe trips since they were both in diapers. And the uh, reason I started it, and Roberta too, is uh, to, as they grow older, you learn to love the country as we do. The canoeing part of our canoe trips, we really love uh, watching the game walk into the water and watching the activity in the woods of which are, every half mile there's something different going on that you can stop and watch. In the evenings with the wolves howling and sitting by the campfire, drinking your last cup of coffee and the sun is setting, is the most peaceful time of the day there is. And uh, myself, I feel closer to my maker there than I did in any church in the world. This is here for us all to enjoy, but it must be managed carefully so it will not be destroyed. The wilderness can survive only if we use it in a civilized manner and not litter it, cut it down, and burn it up. By thinking of the people who will come after us, wanting them to enjoy it as much as we have, the wilderness will survive. We'll be back in just a minute. We hope you've enjoyed our visit to the Wilderness Canoe Country. If you'd like to find out more about Minnesota and camping, ask your librarian for these books. The Little Dark House by Edith Records Warner and Canoe Country by Florence Page Jacques. Be sure to be with us next week for another exciting program as Discovery continues to discover the world. Bye. This has been a Jules Power production in association with ABC News.